Welcome back. You're still watching Politics Tonight, digging beyond the headlines. And now to our interview with the guests of the day. I am joined by the National Missioner of Ansar Dean Society of Nigeria and one of the clerics who met with the military junta in Nigeria Republic, Sheikh Abdurrahman Ahmad, for discussion on the coup and the dialogue option. Thank you so much for joining us, Sheikh. It is a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you were one of the, uh, you were in the Republic as part of the team delegation of Islamic clerics to interact with the coup leaders. How would you describe the mood in the country? Well, um, as far as we're concerned, um, the mood in the country was that of relaxation, um, that of orderliness. People were going about their businesses. We did not witness any disruption, and um, the people appeared to us to be happy. Can we translate that to mean that Nigeria is uh, okay with this, the Jontas? Actually, we had reports of jubilation when mm. the military took over. And, um, well, I, I do not know how to interpret that, but it's as plain as it, uh, as it seems that perhaps uh, people were not happy with uh, the, the, the regime that was toppled. This is by no means justifying military intervention in civil rule. No, I'm just stating exactly what was observed. So your team has been credited for this change of stance uh, by the coup leaders. I mean, initially, now they have now agreed to negotiate uh, with ECOWAS. How did you achieve this? Well, um, like you know, you see, it speaks to the role of uh, you know, religious leaders in ensuring peaceful coexistence, in dousing tension, in engineering consensus, mm. um, and uh, that is exactly what played out. Uh, we made our own personal contacts uh, within Niger and uh, with the people, and some of um, our, our followers, our admirers, um, some of our students, and uh, we met the president, uh, commander-in-chief of the in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, um, Asiwaju Bola Ahmad Tinubu, we were the one who actually asked for government leave to intervene uh, and explore alternative uh, means to resolving this conflict other than the, you know, through the military uh, intervention. And it was like, oh, you think you could do it? Okay. Now you can go ahead. So, and that was uh, how it all started. And contrary to reports that we read in, the, in, in some section of the media, we arrived to a rousing welcome. Mm. Um, it was a red carpet reception. The prime minister met us at the airport. Uh, Islamic scholars from across in the J Republic were there to welcome us. So members of the public were also at the airport to welcome us. And we drove in a motorcade to the uh, presidential palace to meet the head of state. And we had very fruitful discussion. Impressive. So one question many people are curious to get answers to is that, you know, the coup leaders initially refused to meet with ECOWAS delegation or met with your team. What is responsible for this? Well, I think it was largely the approach. And um, I'm also happy to tell you that the first thing that was said at that meeting was for the new leaders in Niger to apologize to the uh, government and people of Nigeria for the way they treated the earlier delegation that was sent by ECOWAS. Their perception of that delegation was uh, that they were not going to be fair to them because they have not been listened to. And of course, the, uh, the, the dialogue, the peaceful approach to it, the diplomatic option 
was not a force to, ex to be explored. Uh, the first thing was that they slammed a sanction against them and they cut power supply, which Nigeria supplies to them. And uh, this somehow made them angry. And they said, um, the, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, they realized that that was a mistake. That was not the approach, and they were sorry for it. And they, they asked us to convey their apology, like I said, to the government and people of Nigeria. So what was responsible was um, a reaction that was based on a perception of, um, you know, unfairness, and that ECOWAS, at that point in time, when they acted the way they acted, was not actually a peacemaker. Uh, they saw ECOWAS at that point in time as, uh, you know, a potential aggressor, mm. and they didn't see the need why they should cooperate. However, uh, after we, we spoke of them and um, we convinced them that they had better options and they accepted and hence the apology. So, Sheikh, I mean, from your interaction with them, would you say they have tangible reasons for toppling a democratically elected president? Because, you know, our engagement with the uh, uh, Nigerians are still ongoing. I do not want to be judgmental. That would be prejudicial. Um, of course, uh, we will get to that at some point. And I can assure you that uh, our discussion was very frank. Um, it, it was not... Uh, it, it was not deceitful. Uh, it was deep. But, you know, some of the things that we discussed um, are not yet ready uh, f f to be shared with the public because we have not formally presented our report to the president. Uh, until then, um, we cannot go into the details. Well, Sheikh, if these school plotters are apologizing, does it not mean that they are sorry that they shouldn't have done what they did? Now, they apologize for the way they treated uh, the former head of state. And that was the apology that they tendered, not for the coup, because they believed, the, and they still believe, they uh, have reasons that are genuine enough for them to topple a, a civilian, a sitting civilian regime. What are those reasons? Uh, like I told you, these, these, these reasons, according to them, I'm not making up reasons for them. Um, and let me say upfront, our intervention was based on the fact that we're anti-war. Um, we are anti-repression. We are anti, you know, a uh, 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 disruption of normal civil life. We're not apportioning blame, but then um, we believe that uh, people are freer and they can exercise their right to choose under a, 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 a civilian administration. Uh, and that military coup interregnum is an aberration. I want to state that upfront we are not cool, uh, you know, um, we are not apologetic about it, and uh, we are not sympathizers, um, you know. Uh, let me state that very clearly up front. Um, however, like I told you, um, someone we are um, uh, diplomatic uh, clerics or, 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 or cleric diplomats, mm -hmm. Whatever, our interest is in de-escalating tension and to convince both sides, uh, the ECOWAS and the Nigerian government, to uh, explore diplomatic option in resolving these rather than going out for a full-blown war because we are convinced that it is an ill wind, a blues no one. No good.
Mm. So, Sheikh, uh, one of the conditions given by ECOWAS to the coup leaders is to restore constitutional order in Niger. Now, from what you've seen, do you see this happening? I'm hopeful that um, with the beginning of, you know, in negotiations, uh, a lot could be achieved. For instance... Uh, it is a diarchy kind of. Mm. That is the arrangement they, they, they have in place now in Niger because they appointed a civilian prime minister who appears to enjoy popularity uh, in the country. And they, uh, according to them, they are not there to stay. They are only there to uh, correct certain anomalies and uh, to forestall, you know, um, a certain potentially devastating, uh, you know, occurrences. They went as far as saying that their intervention, you know, was in the best interest of their country, Niger, and the best interest of Nigeria as a country. Well, um, that is still an area that we'll continue to explore. And I, I'm happy to tell you that uh, um, His Excellency, the President, has, um, you know, um, extended our mandate, so to speak, that our engagement with the government of Niger should be ongoing. So it is just the first step that we have taken and um, we're trying to build confidence so that we're trusted um, by uh, the ECOWAS um, and by the Nigerian government and also by the Nigerian government. And uh, right now, other interested parties are showing, uh, you know, willingness to meet with us. All right. So another question I would like to ask you is, can you and ECOWAS trust these cool leaders to honor any agreements uh, reached with them so far? Well, you see, there is latitude for trust. Uh, I said latitude because it is a relative thing. Um, human beings uh, have a freedom to choose to be honorable, uh, between being honorable and being ignoble, and being dishonorable. We think that um, the Nigerian gov government, as it is uh, you know, currently constituted, will uh, also reciprocate the goodwill so far that um, the echo has, you know, uh, is beginning to show. And the fact that you must note that I said we made initial contacts. We, we put our honor and uh, safety on the line. And from the discussions that we have had, um, we believe that they will not, um, uh, they, they will not do anything that is untoward. We, we, we believe and we hope so, because this is not uh, an ordinary diplomatic engagement. Remember that we're religious leaders and, um, you know, um, including many people who are involved in this, including the, the new military leadership, are also our followers. When I say our followers, I'm being intentional, I'm being deliberate. I do not mean by that that we're privy to their um, our coup d'etat or that they have consulted us. They know that the role that we, we have chosen to play is uh, uh, the role of de-escalation of tension and, you know, the... the, the we wanted to ensure that rather than war, we should talk, we should dialogue, and we can achieve a lot.
All right. So these economic sanctions imposed by ECOWAS uh, are having an impact on the people rather than the coup plotters. I mean, some of the uh, coup plotters have said these sanctions have made it difficult for people to access medicines, uh, food and electricity. But then can sanctions really dissuade the coup uh, leaders? No, sanctions have never been known uh, to, to, you know, play the role that it is intended for. Uh, sanctions will ultimately hurt the people. Unfortunately, in this case, it is not only the people of Niger, but even the people of Nigeria. How? Um, how? Uh, Nigeria has um, perhaps the longest border, you know, with uh, Niger Republic. About seven Nigerian states share border with uh, Niger, and the people on either sides of the divide are uh, one family. There are a lot of trade going on, trade in commodities, in foodstuff, in fish, in onions, in pepper, and so many other things that are not captured, informal trade that runs into you know, millions and billions of Naira. Already as at um, today, uh, some of the traders in Nigeria are already counting their laws in billions. The, the same thing, even Ghanaians are complaining that it has, a, you know, uh, exacerbated inflation and it is making life difficult. So um, there are, you know, unbearable, unexcusable collateral damages as far as these uh, sanctions are, you know, concerned. It is going to affect um, Niger, especially the ordinary people of Niger, it will affect Nigeria, the ordinary people in Nigeria. It will affect some other West African countries and it will worsen the situation in the Sahel. Sahel, the Sahel region, um, is one of the uh, 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 toughest places um, in Africa and in the world. It has. It is very problematic. It 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 is it is uh, an ecological disaster waiting to happen. It is, you know, suffering a lot from the climate change. You know, we we share the 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 Lake Chad uh, together, and the re, the 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 River Niger is also common to some of the countries in the Sahel, including Niger, including Nigeria. Um, so, I mean, one of the reasons for our intervention is that the effect of sanctions will go beyond uh, what um, those who impose it, mm. you know, uh, uh, want. For instance, we got to Niamey, which is the capital of Niger, and they were surprised that ev everywhere in, in the state capital was, you know, well lit. Mm. So it means that for the elites in, in Niger, the, 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 the effect of the power courts uh, is, not, is not on them, it is on the artisan, it is, is on the ordinary people. And it is a double tragedy for them. The, the fuel, you know, because Nigeria has also uh, just removed the subsidy. Um, so it is not easy for them to buy fuel. It is not cheap. It is priced beyond the reach of um, uh, the poor in Niger. So they cannot, they cannot um, fuel their generators uh, as an alternative source of... Uh, so some of these effects are there. So, Sheikh, I, I do apologize. So if the targets are the cool leaders, is there anything ECOWAS can do in this regard? We think that um, the best option for now is dialogue. Other than dialogue, the only thing ECOWAS can do is to tighten the news and uh, put more sanctions. Um, they have a way of avoiding it. Of course, they, they, they put travel restriction they freeze their accounts. That is if they have foreign accounts. Hmm? 
and uh, so on and so forth. These will have, for how many years now, have, has um, a, a America and some other uh, American allies uh, imposed, you know, uh, sanctions on, on Iran? What effect is it having on Iran? Uh, Iran is not yet uh, on its knees. Rather, it is waxing stronger. Of, of course, you know, there is always a, a way to beat sanctions. Of course, I'm not saying, again, let me state, I'm not saying, I'm not being judgmental. I'm not saying that um, who is right and no. That is not what I'm saying, very far from it. But I'm saying, let us exhaust all peaceful avenue before we can consider a military option. And a military option in this instance is like, for instance, Nigeria declaring a war on itself. Because what, we, what do we do with uh, the majority of people in the North who share cultural, uh, religious, and economic ties with the people on the other side? They are going to be equally af affected. And of course, it is going to uh, worsen the insurgency situation in the Sahel. Particularly, it is going to make the porous Nigerian border much, much more porous. We're going to have refugee problem right. and a lot of other problems. All right. So, Sheikh, I mean, with your intervention and dialogue now being prioritized, can, we, can you say with finality uh, that war will be avoided? We hope and pray that um, those who are beating the drums of war are having a rethink. And um, I, I cannot say anything with finality, but we're hopeful that war will be avoided. We already see signs of de-escalation of tension. We already see moderation of rhetorics on either sides. Um, and we're hopeful that this will continue. Thank you so much, Sheikh, for coming on the program and especially for your role in all of this.